The word hate has become a real buzzword in our day and time. And of course, one major problem is the fact that what certain people believe is hate is not really that at all. And even some Christians have the mistaken notion that we are never to hate as children of God. But the Bible makes it clear that is not true. And in fact, there are some things the Bible declares that God himself hates and therefore we as his children should hate as well absolutely the bible declares that god is a god of perfect love even in this little book of first john we see that emphasized several times in chapter 4 verse 7 it says let us love one another for love is from god in verse 8 it says the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 11, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. In verse 16, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And this theme of God as love is prominent throughout Scripture. And yet, the Bible also talks about some things that God hates. In fact, because God is absolutely perfect, he not only loves perfectly, but he also hates perfectly. Really, the truth is these two are inseparable. To love perfectly is to hate perfectly. If you truly love something or someone, you also have to necessarily hate anything that threatens that something or someone. For example, Psalm 97.10 says, Hate evil, you who love the Lord. The hatred of evil is complementary to the love of the Lord. Psalm 119.104 says, from thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. As I grow in my understanding of God's truth, I will naturally hate everything that is false. Whatever it is that you love the most, your love for that will lead you to hate anything that is contrary to that. And we see this perfectly demonstrated in Jesus' cleansing of the temple <coughs> because, as you know, the Jews had turned it into a den of thieves. And that is a picture of the fact that the absolute love of God demands an absolutely perfect hatred of anything that is contrary to his holy will. So that is why the Bible tells us there are some things that God hates. Turn with me for a moment to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, and look with me at verse 16. There are six things that God hates. Wow. The Bible just comes right out and says there's some things that God hates. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Uh, the idea of going from six to seven is a Hebrew way of putting great emphasis on something. So what is it that God hates? First, he hates haughty eyes. Uh, the King James has a proud look, uh, the, the literal Hebrew reads, lofty eyes. The idea is that of looking down on someone else in disdain as if they are below you 
in value or significance, looking down on someone. Now, John is also going to talk a lot about pride, but this is the first thing that God hates. Why is this the first one? Because it is the sin of pride that is really the fountain of all other sins. And then you can just go down the list. God hates a lying tongue. He hates dishonesty. Why? Because God is a God of truth. He hates lies. He hates deceit. He hates anything that is false. He also hates hands that shed innocent blood. He hates murder. He hates the taking of innocent life of any kind. And by the way, I believe that includes abortion. And our world has gone to great lengths to make that seem acceptable, but I'm here to tell you today, God hates it. He hates it. And then you can go on, verse 18, God hates a heart that devises wicked plans. This is a person who plans wickedness in advance. This is a person that, that schemes and devises to do evil. MacArthur describes this as the imaginations of fallenness that corrupt rationality. It is fabricating that turns the heart into the workshop of Satan. Closely associated with this, God hates feet that run rapidly to evil. This is the actual carrying out of the evil that is planned in the heart. This is not someone who just stumbles into sin. This is someone who schemes it and plans it and then carries it out. God hates that. In fact, really what this implies is they're anxious to commit it. They run to it as fast as they can. It's like running to evil. God hates that. God also hates a false witness, verse 19, who utters lies. God hates perjury. He hates the giving of a false report, falsely accusing someone. He also hates one who spreads strife among brothers. He hates the one who sows, sows discord and causes division. Now, we don't have to guess about any of this. All of these things are straight from the Bible. But there are some other things that Scripture also is just as clear on. Malachi 2.16, God hates divorce. He hates it. Jeremiah 44, we see where God hates idolatry. In Amos 5, God hates hypocrisy. In Revelation 2, God hates false religion. And again, the reason that God hates these things is because they are the exact opposite of what God loves. They are ex the exact opposite of his holy nature. And getting to our text, in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, we find a love that God hates. God hates the love of the world. And remember, John is giving a series of tests in this book to help people know if they are truly born again. Here, he clearly says that if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Now, we need to take the time to go through this carefully, and it may take us a couple weeks to do that. But this is another test, test number five so far, by which Christians can know they are truly children of God. And you may remember 1 John 5, 13 gives us the purpose for this book. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. It was written for the purpose of assuring true believers that they do, in fact, have eternal life. John doesn't want any of God's children to lack assurance of salvation. 
But at the same time, it also serves to warn those who, have made, who may have made a false profession of faith in Christ that they need to examine themselves and see if they are really of the faith. And John is giving this series of tests so they can tell the difference between genuine saving faith and that which is false. There are some tangible things that a genuine believer can point to to give evidence that he has been truly spiritually regenerated. So John is saying, make sure you have this evidence in your life. And here with this fifth test, he's saying, look and see if there is still a love for the world, because if there is, then you can know you're not truly saved. Is there still a love for the world? Of course, we need to understand what he means by this. But this is another way that we can know where we stand spiritually. So let's walk through this important passage. And in a way, it's really an extension of a previous passage. In chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, John had talked about the evidence of love. And now he's going to clarify that he's not talking about love for the world. This may be sort of a footnote to that passage. In other words, John is really saying Christians are marked by their love, but it's not love for the world. This, again, sets them in contradistinction from those who have made false professions of faith in Christ. So with that in mind, we're going to see this text in four main divisions. We're going to see the command, the conclusion, the composition, and the contrast. Let's begin with the command. We find a, <coughs> a simple command in the first part of verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. Now that's simple enough, right? But there's a whole lot here that we need to unpack. And one thing we need to realize right off the bat is that this is a command that is given to Christians. This book was written to believers. Even though it is used as a way of distinguishing genuine believers from false professors of faith, this was given to believers. And as we will see, even genuine born-again Christians can still be tempted to flirt with the world. So this applies to us. And here we're commanded not to do that. We're commanded not to love the world. Now we need to understand what John means by the world. John is talking about not loving the world. So what does he mean when he says that? As I'm sure you know, the word world is used in a number of different ways in Scripture. Sometimes it's used to refer to the physical world, the created order. That's not what John is talking about here. Sometimes the Bible speaks of the world of people, like in John 3.16, but that's not what John is talking about here either. No, John is focused on something much deeper than that. And to set this up, the Greek word for world is the word cosmos. It basically refers to some kind of ordered system. It denotes arrangement. It is the opposite of chaos. Our English word cosmetics comes from this world, this word. So people who use cosmetics on their face are basically getting their face in order, right? That's what they're doing. And according to Dr. Hebert, the, the phrase the world is used six times in three verses here. So it is clearly John's focus. In fact, this is really one of John's favorite terms. But it's very 
important for us to understand how John is using this term because as one commentator put it, it has been used to denounce everything from buttons to beer. John is clearly not talking about the physical created worlds. He's not talking about admiring a beautiful sunset or enjoying nature. When he says that we're not to love the world, he is not meaning that we should never enjoy the beautiful world that God has created. In fact, we should. We should. When God created the world, he declared that it was good. And even though it is now marred by sin, it is still a majestic display of God's glory. I mean, Psalm 19 says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals his knowledge. We should love this created world for what it is, a reflection of the glory and majesty of God. It is a display of his infinite mind. It is a demonstration of his sovereign rule. And as I am sure you know, it is absolutely staggering to contemplate the awesome wonder of God's created order. From the massive ordering of the planets and the stars all the way down to the incredible order of the tiniest cell. It just blows your mind. All of that is a reflection of God's glory. That's not what John is talking about in this passage. <clears throat> and he's not talking about the world of people. John 3.16 3, says, For God so loved the world... <clears throat> that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Obviously, he is not speaking there of the inanimate world but the human world, right? God loves people. God sent his only begotten son to save people. In John 1.10 we read, he, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world did not know him. It wasn't the earth and the stars that did not know him. It was people who did not know him. Not all people, but many people did not recognize him for who he was. We've even seen this kind of usage in uh, this letter of 1 John, I mean, back in uh, the same chapter here in verse 2, John said, and he is the propitiation for our sin, sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, right? The word world there is obviously referring to people. In chapter 4, verse 14, he writes, and we have be." held and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Same thing. The world of people. Now, that verse is not implying some sort of universal salvation. But the salvation that he's speaking of is the salvation of people. Those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, the Bible clearly uses the word world in this way, but that's not what John is talking about in chapter 2, verse, verses 15 through 17. Well, if it's not the physical world and it's not the world of people, then what is it? It is the invisible spiritual system of evil. That is the world we are not to love. It is the system that is operated by Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is working in the children of disobedience who is now leading the course of this world. It is that system that he's talking about. Cosmos can refer to any kind of system. In this case, it is an evil system. It is the evil order with all its elements and all its components that works against the things 
of God. In fact, notice that verse 15 uses a double negative in this command. John says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Not only should we not have a love for the evil world system of Satan, but we should hate every aspect of it. All these things, John says, are in direct opposition to God. Now, this is very similar to what John was talking about in chapter 1 when he talked about darkness. The added phrase, nor the things in the world, particularizes this prohibition to include loving any specific aspect or feature of this evil system. Hebert says, John is not calling for monastic separation from the world, but for an inner attitude of separation from the sinful world and its practices. So John is using the word world here metaphorically, and we shouldn't be surprised about that because we do that kind of thing all the time. I mean, we talk about the world of sports. We talk about the world of politics. We talk about the world of science. What do we mean by that? We mean the order and the structure that is behind those disciplines. These are systems of ideas and activities and purposes. They speak of certain realms of human life. In the same way, John is using this word world to refer to that system of evil that is controlled by Satan. It is that which opposes God and opposes Christ. It's the very opposite of what comes from God, and that's why verse 16 says it doesn't come from the Father. It doesn't come from the Father. Now, how do we know that John is using this term this way? We'll turn over to chapter 5 for just a moment. chapter 5, and look with me at verse 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Literally, it says it belongs to him. He controls it for the time being. Turn back to chapter 4 just a moment, and look at verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because, notice, many false prophets have gone out into the world. This system of evil is loaded with false prophets. It is made of anti-God teaching. Keep reading there. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Here's how you can tell the true teachers from the false teachers. What is it? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. If a teacher gets his Christology right, you know he's a true teacher. You can know that what he is teaching is coming from God because he says the right thing about Jesus Christ. On the other hand, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And then John says something very interesting. He says, this is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. There is a pervasive spirit in the world that is anti Christ, anti-Christ. It is against Christ and against everything he stands for. Of course, we know there's going to be an ultimate antichrist that is going to come at the end of the age. But here, John is talking about the spirit of antichrist. This is the primary characteristic of Satan's evil world system. Look at verse 4 there. 
You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We are overcomers because the power of Christ in us is greater than the power of Satan in the world. But over and over again, we see this world system of evil being referred to. And what we need to know is that Satan uses the unregenerate children of disobedience in his system. Jesus used the phrase, the children of this world, in one of his parables in Luke 16. It literally means the offspring of the world. These are those who are still in darkness. These are unbelievers. And Satan uses unbelievers as part of his system. But John says, that's not us. That's not us. We're from God. We are overcomers. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are not of this world. But those who are unregenerate are still part of Satan's world system. And you and I are not to love that world system. In fact, we are to stand against that system. We are to fight against that system. I mean, think about it. What is the dominant spirit of the world system? It is that which is anti-Christ. Anti-Christ. It is completely against Christ. Now, this can take a, a lot of different forms. It, it may take the form of some false religion like Buddhism, Islam, or any number of Eastern religions. It might take the form of a cult or even some aberrant brand of so-called Christianity. MacArthur says, you name it, whatever it is, the common denominator is that it contains a misrepresentation of Jesus Christ and the glories of salvation, and it is pervaded by an endless line of false prophets. But the question for us is this. Where is the line drawn between the world and those who are no longer a part of the world? Where's that line drawn? The line was crossed when you became a believer in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The truth of the matter is that the world and the true family of God are really polar opposites. They cannot both be embraced at the same time. I mean, people always ask questions like, uh, can someone be truly born again and stay in a false religious system? Not for very long, because a genuine believer is going to hate everything that is false, right? He's going to hate everything about that false system, and he won't be able to stay attached to it. And these people who say, you know, you can go to heaven without the gospel, that, you know, you can go to heaven by just being a good person in whatever religion you are in, people who say that don't understand that in every false system of belief, there is built into it the very spirit of antichrist. It's built into it. And God never rewards those who are functioning in an antichrist system. In fact, the entire world is built on these two systems. It's all about the world or the family of God. Jesus clearly talked about these two systems. Go to chapter 3 for just a moment there in 1 John. Chapter 3. Look at verse 13. Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. You should expect that. That should not surprise you. Why? Because they're part of a different system. 
They hated Jesus. They're going to hate those who follow Jesus. They're driven, why? By an antichrist spirit. Drop back down to verse 1 of chapter 3. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. It's all about two different systems, folks. And those who are of the world system are not going to listen to God's truth. They will not heed the message of the gospel. They will not believe on the Savior that God has sent into the world. And listen, this evil world system is damning people by the thousands into an eternal hell. How could we love a system like that? How could we not hate a system like that? So please understand here, we're not just talking about sin. We're talking about an entire system of belief in many different forms that will ultimately damn millions of people. We can't love a system like that. And we can't even love a small fraction of that system. What does John say? Do not love the worlds nor the things in the world, right? Don't love the world. This means we can't embrace any form of worldliness. For the life of me, folks, I cannot understand how advocates of the seeker movement and the emerging church can imply that the way to win the world is to be just like the world. I can't understand that. That is not biblical. We must be different from the world. We must be different from the world. Well-known commentator William Barclay says, to this day, the Christian cannot escape the obligation to be different from the world. We have to be different. Westcott says, this is a matter in which there is no neutrality. A man either loves the world or he loves God. It's one or the other. These are mutually exclusive. It can't be both. In fact, Jesus said, you can't serve two masters at the same time. In the same way you can't serve God and money at the same time, you can't love God and love the world at the same time. The same thing applies to the church as a whole. We can't love the world as a church. Well, turn with me for a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians 10, and let's pick it up in verse 2. Paul says, some think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, Paul's going to do a little play on words here in response to some critics who had accused him of being fleshly, carnal, or sinful. But playing off of that, he says in verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In essence, Paul is saying here, I agree, I'm human, but just remember, we are engaged in a spiritual war. It is the kingdom of Satan against the kingdom of God. It's Christ against antichrist. And the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons. They are spiritual weapons. We can't fight this spiritual war with human weapons. What is the battle? It is the battle between truth and error. The battle between truth and error. It's the battle between the false system of Antichrist and the true system of God. Verse 4, where the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful 
for the destruction of fortresses. Now, here, the Antichrist system, the world system, is pictured as a series of fortresses. This is intentionally in the plural form because there are many different aspects to this false system. There are multitudes of ideas, beliefs, philosophies, ideologies, everything from primitive animism to very complex world religions. All kinds of theories, all kinds of worldviews, all kinds of approaches to life. Fortresses. And notice Paul goes on to define what he's talking about in verse 5. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The world system is made up of speculations, things people have made up on their own, things that have no real basis in truth, just theories and guesses. And the bottom line is, according to God's word, they are really lofty things that are being raised up against the true knowledge of God. That's what they really are. But you see, we're on the other side. And what are we supposed to be doing? Well, we're supposed to be destroying those speculations. We're supposed to be challenging that which is false. How do we do that? We do that with the word of God. We're to be about taking captive every false thought that is raised up against disobedience to Christ. What is that? It's everything that comes against the biblical gospel. We're to challenge every false idea in regard to the true gospel of Christ. That's why, folks, we are always in a battle for the Bible, and we're always in a battle for the purity of the gospel. Satan will always seek to distort the truth. So this is our mandate. We're to go out into the world and we're to confront Satan's lies and we're to challenge the anti-God and anti-Christ spirit of the world system. That's our job. And we're to bring down those false ideas and we're to smash those fortresses to the ground with the mighty spiritual weapons we have at our disposal. This is the war we are in, and we're to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Now, folks, we didn't get very far this morning. This is such a rich passage. We're just getting started. We'll pick it up here next time. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, ask today that you would help us to really understand the richness of what is given in this text. Help us, help us not to love the world, nor the things in the world. Help us to recognize what is of Satan and what is of God. And Lord, help us by your grace, with your spiritual weapons, your word, that we can go out and we can pull down these false speculations, that we can destroy these fortresses, and that we can help people to understand the true gospel and come to know you. So, Lord, help us to be about that, and, Lord, help us to uh, be firm in that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as always, we'll give you an opportunity if you need to come to know Christ today or you need to make some kind of decision for the Lord this morning to be a part of this church family or something else you need to do. We'll do that at the end of the service. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper uh, first. But when we get to the end of the service, we'll have some of our elders here near the front. And I encourage you to come and talk to them if there's a 
a decision you need to make or a commitment to Christ that you need to make, uh, need, need someone to pray with or um, whatever it might be, you respond to the Lord this morning. Let me ask our men who will be serving the Lord's